Do you recall all the places on the highways that you've been? Do you remember all the faces that you've seen? Now it's a shame that there's no time to get to know one another. No time to talk to every sister, every brother. that we all must face. That place is the grave. Every path leads there. Every heart chills with the thought of it. It's the final resting place for all mankind, or is it? On this program, you'll experience what it's like to walk beyond death's door and to come back and tell about it. You'll meet the heart surgeon who was changed by the stories of the people who came back. And you'll meet a man who began to live on the day he died. All this and more on this edition of Going Places. Hello, I'm Beverly Richardson. And I'm Carl Richardson, and welcome to Going Places. On this program, we'll cross the threshold into the afterlife and find out how one doctor went beyond saving someone's life and helped save his soul. Pay close attention to Dr. Maurice Rawlings. He's going to demonstrate CPR. What you learn on this show may save someone's life. But first, let's meet a man whose very life has been forged through the fire. A man who is tough as steel. The blacksmith. Until the Industrial Revolution, the blacksmith was the most important member of the community. Shoes for the horses, weapons, tools, and just about anything else made of metal came through the skilled hands of the blacksmith. The hammer of the blacksmith still rings clear in some places, like Spruce Pine, North Carolina. This is B. Hinsley, a master blacksmith from the time he was a young man. He makes the hammer sing while he works, forging the hot metal into whatever he desires. Good to see you. Good, Good to see. see you. How are you doing this beautiful day? Oh, this is fine. This is October, a beautiful day up here in the mountain. Now, it takes a lot of patience to be a blacksmith, to work on intricate things like this, doesn't it? Well, you've got to really be patient because all of this work here is forged and hand hammered out. And what we'll do in a few minutes, we'll show you how forge work's done inside the shop. All right. Well, I been in there once before and I've seen some really intricate and beautiful things. Could we go inside and see some of the things that you've made? Yes, sir. We'll be able to fire this time work a little bit. Okay. A blazing fire prepares the iron for B's skilled hammer. He learned the craft from a man I named Daniel Boone. Boone. The Boone family were blacksmiths traditionally and I happened to be his neighbor and I started looking in at his shop and drifting into the shop when I was just a small boy. And I, I don't guess I was over five or six years old then. And then when I uh, began to get older, I began to make knives and stuff in his shop. And he seen that I had a uh, kind of a little bit of initiative to want to be a blacksmith. So he began to show me some. Uh, now, who was this? Daniel Boone. He was the sixth generation of the old original Daniel Boone. B. 
His skill at forging functional cooking ware earned his work a place in the Smithsonian Institute. It's a marvel of craftsmanship by a master blacksmith. And this one here is, uh, this is, the, of course, the pots, and they had different size pots, and this is a tea kettle where they used to heat the water back in old colonial days. But tell now, us about this beautiful fireplace set here. This is, uh, a lot of people use these today in the fireplaces, especially since oil has become scarcely, more people are going back to the fireplace and we make a lot of fire sets and andarns and things like that. We have some knives in here. We used to do quite a, quite a few knives like this and this is deer antlers that we have that we used in uh, the early days to chip Indian arrows and things like that, but now we use a lot of them for knife handles and things like that. All them's hand forged right over there in the the fire, and this is a two-edged sword. This goes back to biblical days, and there's a spiritual side to this right here. You know the word of the Lord will cut like a two-edged sword, and you see how sharp that is. Now, that's how sharp the, the, uh, the word of the Lord is, you see, and a fellow ought to think about that as he goes down through life of living. It'll cut out all the bad and leave the good. B's son, Mike, was so fascinated by his father's skill that he decided to go through the seven-year-long apprenticeship Michael, necessary like to, to become a master Paul, blacksmith. Hello, oh, Mike. Glad to meet you. I understand you used to be the world's youngest blacksmith. The hammer and the anvil have a language all their own, and B and Mike speak it fluently. There are five things to do with that one lid. He's telling me one specific spot to hit in because we have two different viewpoints of light. He's telling me how hard to hit that spot. He's also telling me what direction to take my hammer in. Then he also tells me what quadrant of the face to use. And the most important thing is at what angle that I hit that. And I exaggerate the angle because you can only see it with a human eye. The forging of hard iron into something of value takes a strong hand, a mighty hammer, and a well-tuned anvil. And when the work is done, there's nothing like a little music to relax by. We'll be back with Going Places right after this. And now let's go to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and meet Dr. Maurice Rawlings, the life after death heart surgeon. So if they're in trouble with something of that sort, they come here. Maurice Rawlings is a heart surgeon and an author in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Years ago, medicine was restricted in its knowledge of clinical death resuscitation. But the advent of CPR, or cardiopulmonary resuscitation, brought the knowledge that there is life after death. Um, pacemakers will do things like um, monitor people, like we're doing over here, people with impending heart attacks, rhythm disturbance, heart failure. Dr. Rawlings is dedicated to saving lives. His skill and knowledge have done just that with many of his patients. His office is well equipped. His staff is friendly. And his casual wit and gentle manner helps patients feel relaxed in what is usually a very tense time. You exercise until you get some pain. That same pressure in the middle of your chest you were complaining about. So far on your cardiogram, it don't show anything. Uh, heart rhythm disturbances is the basis of life. I gave you a pacemaker, and when it slows down or gets gray hair, so to speak, we'll put an artificial one in. Your life depends on your pacemaker. If you stop beating, you're dead. And there's several ways that you can stop beating, one of which is heart attack. So this rhythm is the basis of life. And if we understood it more properly, we 
could prolong life better. What if someone near you suddenly died? Pay attention as Dr. Rawlings explains the life-saving CPR. When someone falls unconscious at your feet, the first thing you do is see if they're awake or not. Hey, Annie, are you okay? Hey, are you all right? They may be just sleeping and nothing else wrong with them. Then you check to see if they're breathing. Not the heartbeat, breathing first. She's not breathing, I don't feel it. I don't see the chest moving. She's not breathing. I'll give her four quick breaths, closing off her nostrils. So my breath will go down through her mouth to the lungs, lift the chin to unobstruct the airway. If it's unobstructed, the chest will rise, and these lungs you'll see inflate. Four quick breaths, then I check and see if the heart's beating by listening and feeling. And if there's no pulse next to the Adam's apple, there's no pulse, she's got no heartbeat. So quickly I locate two fingers above the xiphoid bone on yourself here, place my hand, two fingers above, reinforce with the other one, and compress 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, give 15 compressions, and then two quick breaths, and then 15 compressions again, and then two quick breaths. I say I've given 15, then I'll go back immediately to the head. Lift the head either by this means or just chin tilt method. Two quick breaths, come back and locate my hand again and start massage as much in as out. It takes time to massage the heart. You can't jerk it in like most people like this is improper. You massage it in, massage it in. And you get a pulse if you ever want to find out if they're living reach up with one hand as you're doing one hand massage and see if you get a pulse from your heartbeat that you're impressing upon the patient between the breastbone and backbone. If you're doing it properly, you'll get a pulse. You don't need lights to see it. You'll get a pulse whether they ever live again or not. But as soon as you stop, the pulse is gone, they're dead again. They'll convulse, eyes turn up in the head, stop breathing, heart stop beating. You alternate breathing and heartbeat. 15 to 2 ratio if you're by yourself, 5 to 1 ratio if you've got a helper to do the breathing. You'll be doing five compressions, and he'll throw in a breath on every fifth beat. So that's how it works. Half of these people will come back and talk to you. These sudden, unexpected deaths. That's how you do it. His first book came after bringing so many people back from death's door. He noticed striking similarities in the stories of those who came back. These patients are giving me a true story. There's a life after death. Then I better know what's going to happen to me before I die. It may not be safe for me to die, actually. So I dusted off the Judeo-Christian Bible. I've been gathering dust on this shelf. And I said to myself, my God, just suppose just for fun, just suppose the Bible's true word for word and not just a history book like I always thought it was. Changed my whole life. Dr. Rawlings continued gathering stories from his patients until one day something dramatic happened. What's the worst case scenario you have ever experienced of a, an out-of-the-body experience from someone who has died and gone to hell? Probably this mail carrier, rural mail, U.S. mail carrier. He came in with his chest pain, and to reproduce it, instead of running him upstairs when he'd get it at home, we ran him on a treadmill, hooked up to an EKG like this. And instead of the EKG going haywire, it just stopped altogether. Instead of showing just heart pain, his heart stopped during the treadmill. He died right on the very embarrassing. And it's very inconsiderate on his part because people out front will leave the office knowing what's going on in the back here. You know, it's not good for business. Anyhow, here he is dead, and I'm starting resuscitation. The nurses are there. The other doctors had gone. It was the end of the day. Uh, and he had a heart blockage, one of these things of rhythm disturbances that won't respond. 60% die before they get to the hospital with rhythm. He had one. We uh, put a pacemaker wire down the collarbone vein into the heart. Heart's beating the collarbone vein. Pacemakers inside the heart. We just turn on the dial what rate we want to overcome the block so he'll respond to the resuscitation. He's living today. But every time I let go of the resuscitation to get the instruments, he's on the floor. Uh, he'd convulse. Eyes go up in his head, turn blue, sputter, stop breathing once more, heart stop beating once more. I'd reach over and start him up again just like he can. He kept saying, I'm in hell. 
I thought he was crazy. And, and so I told him, being a good doctor, I thought, keep your hell to yourself. I'm busy saving your life. This is Charles McCaig, who died that day in Dr. Rawlings office and lived to tell about it. I have no recall of actually being in hell. My experience of, of being in hell was that when I did come to the, having CPR was the horror feeling of death, the smell of death, the, if it was at all possible, I was gotten up and run or climb a wall or whatnot. I had, I was horrified to the point of death. I knew something horrible had happened. I was later told that my eyes had dilated. My hair was literally standing, standing on end. And uh, I, the only thing I could think possibly had happened, I had been to hell. But as far as recall, I had no, no recall actually being in there. But it was, it was so horrible. And the experience turned from being horrible to pleasant. The next and then he said something that really disturbed me. That he said, Doctor, pray for me. What would you do, Carl? Yeah? You pray for him. Nurses are looking at you. You better do something. Dying man's last wish. You do something. I'll make up a little make-believe prayer, you know? Something that won't count. Say this prayer to me. And tell him I'm blood spurting. I'm working on him. Resuscitation, putting in this thing. He'll die and start him up again. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Say it. Repeat it after me. He would. And if I die, I want to go to heaven. Please keep me out of hell. Very simple. And if I live, I'm on the hook. I'm yours forever. Some, it was so simple, it was stupid. And then he asked me to repeat that after him. When I did, everything thing changed from a horrible experience to a pleasant experience. I have no, had no fear of death. And I went and lapsed back out where I met my mother, my stepmother. It was very recognizable, just as if you was looking at a human being or as a live person, you could recognize them so easily. My mother passed away when I was 15 months old, and had I ever seen a picture or a photograph of her, I, I never remembered it, and I recognized her immediately who she was. Since then, I had gotten a photograph of her, and it's as identical to the same person. My stepmother passed away in 1960. She looked just like she did before she got sick. She looked like a beautiful woman. She looked healthy. I came back to, and my second experience was of going through a meadow or a valley of colors. This fellow that had the conversion experience from this make-believe prayer, don't ever say make-believe prayer. This make-believe prayer backfired got me too. I was converted. Both of us on the floor at the same time. And this, he's been on the hook ever since, strong Christian man. And I'm the weak one, but he's the strong one. And it's been that way ever since. Uh, that's just one case. There are about 300 other cases. Strange thing that two of them were doctors, themselves victims, themselves resuscitated from death, this clinical death, not biologic death, where tissues die, rigor mortis sets in. Now you got to have a resurrection, not a resuscitation. We ain't resurrecting anybody. We can't. We're resuscitating a reversible death. Two of the doctors themselves recovered, and everybody knows doctors go to hell proverbially. They did. Uh, honest, I'm joking, but they did. But they had this strange experience. Instead of the out-of-the-body experience with a sequence of events uh, of good type, they were bad type. As a physician, his medical like skills help save lives. No TB, no the true life-after-death experiences as told in his three books help save souls. And it all began when Charles McKegg died and got a second chance. These, uh... No question about whether it did happen or it didn't happen. What I have said, there may be some question to it, but actually it's clinical deaths and the uh, uh, hard arrest and the clinical deaths that follow actually happen on a medical record made of it. So that is proof of that happening. And of course, there's no proof of what I'm relating about what 
I saw or what happened. There's no proof except me. And uh, Lord, I walked earth from one end to the other to relate it. This is Carl Richardson. Join us again next week at this same time when together we'll be going places. Oh, oh, oh.